and thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America, and we are so happy to have in the studio with us today Francesca Ramsey, out with her hot new book. Well, that escalated quickly, Memoirs and Mistakes of an Accidental Activist. Francesca is an actress, comedian, video blogger with over 29 million views on YouTube and over half a million followers across Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. I'm sure it's more than that in the last five minutes, right? Uh, she uh, first, of course, burst onto the scene uh, with her video, What White Girls Say to Black Girls. So thank you so much. Francesca, we have to uh, clean up a little bit. Uh, what <laughs> you were, did a great job of self-censoring. Right, right, of what stuff, is actually stuff, stuff white, white girls, girls say. say to black girls, which is so hilarious. And I love that what you, when you talk in your book about what you would have done differently, uh, one of the better things. Better wig. A better wig, okay. Better, you know, you want to make sure that you level up and you get the <laughs> highest quality <laughs> of strands, but I just went to my local beauty supply and, and picked something up. Yeah, so now before we show a clip of this, which is hilarious, I want you to tell me how all of this happened. You'd been doing YouTube videos. I'd for, been making videos for about six years before this video went viral. Making about $100 yeah, now and then. Now and then I was making a little bit of money. I had a full-time job as a graphic designer. For a clothing, your, your yes, retail career, yes, right? right? Yes, so I was working in retail, but I'd also done beauty and, and fashion stuff as a graphic designer. And so YouTube was just a hobby for me. Um, I wanted to be in entertainment, but I didn't really know how, I couldn't get auditions, I couldn't get an agent. And so um, I made this video as a parody of another popular video, which was Stuff Girls Say. And I was coincidentally the first person to make a video that was directed to someone else. Um, and so I wanted to really kind of reflect on my experience growing up in West Palm Beach, Florida, where many times I was in spaces where I was the only black girl and well-meaning friends and coworkers would say things to me that, in retrospect, really were not appropriate. <laughs> I think many of us heard these things through the uh, years. Uh, clearly 12 million or yeah. so people had heard so, these things. So anyway, you put this up. Yes. And then? And then uh, by the time I, I put it up before I went to work, and by the time I got to lunch, 1.5 million people had watched it. Unbelievable. And my entire world changed. So uh, the, instead of getting $100, ultimately? Um, from this video, I made about $35,000. Oh my gosh. Um, and it opened doors where I was able to get an agent and start speaking at colleges. And, oh my. And it just completely opened my career for me. And, and now I've written for television. And, and now and I've perform. written a book. <laughs> right, right, right. Let's, let's take a look at that clip right now. <laughs> Not to be racist, but not to sound racist, but not to sound racist. My grandma hates collards. Wait, is that racist? Why isn't there a white entertainment television? The Jews were slaves too. You don't hear us complaining about it all the time. Is it like bad to do blackface? Is that still like a thing? You can say the N word, but I can't. How is that okay? My best friend was black. I mean, she's still black. Oh, we're not really friends anymore. Oh my God, I'm practically black. Twinsies. <laughs> I told you to stop borrowing my lotion. Why is my computer acting so ghetto? This is so ghetto. Ghetto. I'm not really into black guys though. So cute for a black guy, right? That one kind of looks like you. <laughs> Tanisha, what did you do to my computer? Can I touch it? Okay, I'm already touching it a little. Is this real? Is this all yours? Wait, it's not real? It is. It is. Okay, sorry. So happy. Kind of feels like a Brillo pad. <laughs> so, all right. So uh, how many uh, total at this point? For... Uh, it's almost about 12 million views. 12 but million. But it got five of those in the first week. Which right. is still mind blowing to me. And a million and a half in the first hour that it yeah, was up or a couple, day, couple in the first half a couple of hours. Unbelievable, unbelievable. And so how soon before you quit your job? Um, I was at my job for about a month. Um, and I was working as a graphic designer, so I was able to kind of work around my schedule to go on auditions and to do some meetings, but it was getting increasingly difficult to keep my job and also just 
you know, give entertainment a real shot. And so thankfully uh, I was able to quit and my employers were super understanding and nice about it. And um, here I am five, almost six years later and I'm, I'm still hanging in there. Unbelievable. So, uh, and now you have this great book that you've, that you've written because you, you became a, an internet uh, celebrity uh, and, and for some part because you were very funny, very snarky, and some would say really tough on a lot of on a lot of people. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, I think, you know, this was a whirlwind that I was not prepared for. And I think that while I really appreciate all of the things that have come out of my career and, and these awesome opportunities, upon self-reflection, I realized that there were just so many things I were was not prepared for um, in terms of having these tough conversations about identity. And I made a lot of mistakes along the way. What? And I just feel what? very thankful that yeah. people were open to letting me make those mistakes. T talk to us about the mistakes. What's <clears throat> What I do think, you consider to be your biggest uh, mistake? Um, I think one thing that I've done, and I see a lot of other people do, is there are some, t some conversations that don't need to happen online. And I think sometimes- Now that's a shock. I know. That's a I shock. Can you believe it? <laughs> I live on the internet and I think sometimes you need to take a break. Here's the thing, yeah. online, so many things can get misrepresented or misunderstood. You don't have body language, you don't have eye contact, you don't have you know, the ability to put your hand on somebody's shoulder and say, listen, the thing you said really hurt my feelings, I want us to talk about it. Um, and instead, online, it kind of becomes a very performative, and I am so very guilty of that. I love a good gif, I love a good snarky, you know, drag a little tea spilled here and there. And then what happens is everybody jumps in and the person on the other end of the conversation, oftentimes they're not able to actually understand what it is that they said or did wrong because they literally have thousands or millions of people who kind are. of piling on and sometimes rightfully so. Right. But I, I think, love the way you phrase it. You know, in some cases, that's a bell you cannot unring it after is, you've said. Absolutely. I mean, once you put it out there, um, to quote Christina Aguilera, you know, genie in a bottle, the genie's <laughs> let out and you can't put it back in. Um, and sometimes what happens, and again, I've been guilty of this, is that you don't have all the information. You don't actually know what really happened or God forbid you think that someone said something that they didn't actually say and now you have like unleashed the hounds on them and you you can't go back so you're you're actually advising caution a little less snark um i mean i love snark uh, snark <laughs> has a time and a place but i think we have to be cautious with the people that we really care about and realize that our our inclination to put somebody on blast on facebook for example is not necessarily gonna move the conversation forward. And that sometimes if we can pull somebody aside and be honest about the mistakes that we've made and the way that we had to learn, that that can help somebody grow and learn in a way that's not necessarily going to happen if it happens in this public forum like Facebook or Twitter, for example. So, but it, but it got you, the snark, uh, a career. <laughs> it helped me. That's <laughs> right. why I'm not going to say that snark is bad. Sometimes right. it's right. good. <laughs> so, uh, The Nightly Show with Larry. Yes. Will Moore. And so we have a, a, a piece I want to show because it was so funny where you, you really, your career is based on explaining a lot of things, not just what. Right. What white girls and black girls, <laughs> no, a lot of thankfully. things, including, including slavery. And Michelle Obama made her famous speech uh, at the uh, Democratic Convention where she talked about living in a house that was built by slaves. And people were really upset about that. They really did not understand why she said that or why it was relevant. Um, and so I was really fortunate that it had a great segment on the nightly show uh, where I talked about things that were happening online and, and really kind of explaining what people were missing about certain conversations. Let's, let's take a look at that clip right now. <laughs> You do these mental gymnastics because it's uncomfortable to acknowledge this country was built in part by slaves and that we benefit from their work. But what else do you think they were doing? We Shall Overcome isn't a song about how hard it is to play the banjo. 
And the worst part, if you hadn't been so caught up on the word slavery, you would have realized that Michelle Obama was saying something positive. Yes, the White House was built by slaves, which is why it's such a big deal that we have a black president. If you have a problem with this, then I'm gonna guess it only is because of who's saying it. Who's saying it? And not Melania. And not. If she had said it, it the, the, the segment ends by me saying, I believe in a house built by slaves. <laughs> and maybe if it was done in Melania's voice, people would have been more open to it. Right. And on De Decoded, you on MTV, you have to explain a lot of things. Yes. The show is really just a breakdown about identity and race and pop culture and how they intersect. And every episode, we really try to live up to our name and decode these topics in a way that people can understand. So, I, and I've enjoyed some of these se segments tremendously. I thought about you when I saw Michelle Wolf at the correspondence dinner. She's so funny. She, I, I, it's hard to make me laugh. She, I laughed out loud a few times during and that. And she does not pull any punches, which is something I really appreciate about her. You know, she has not backed down. She stays true to what she believes. And I think that that's something that we all could really learn from and, and something that I really appreciate about her. Because sometimes I'm a little afraid to speak up for myself or I think, oh, goodness, this is going to be misinterpreted. And she says, nope, I'm saying what I'm saying. Take it or leave it. And would you have done the same? Would you have gone that far as far as she went? Or would you have knowing yeah, now? Yeah, I mean, I I think she went far in a way that made sense. I don't think she crossed any lines. I don't think that she said or said anything that was uh, inappropriate. I think she has more of a potty mouth than I do. Um, but I think that that makes it really funny, especially because she has such a great voice. I think that her voice is such a direct contrast oftentimes to the things that she's saying. And that's what makes it extra, extra funny. So when, when the correspondents pulled their support of her, what, what was your reaction to that when they said, oh, um, that was too much? I, you know, I think it's ironic considering I find oftentimes a lot of conservative folks uh, cry about people being snowflakes and wanting to run to their safe spaces. And I felt like uh, a lot of the things that Michelle said were truthful and that's why they were so upset about it. So I felt that it was a little hypocritical for them suddenly to be chastising her about her language when our president uses some choice language himself. Um, and I, I think that, you know, the truth hurts and that's why they were so upset about it. And, and one of the reasons that your book is so helpful is that we really are in the thick of this trolling, hacking, you know, craziness online, and you're saying now, uh, I mean, there are a lot of people because of the video that you did and some other things that they call you uh, anti-white. Uh, oh, absolutely. So they, that is one of the nicer the <laughs> things that has been said about me. I've been called everything but a child of God online, let me tell you. <laughs> so, so were you ever hurt, afraid? Um, I mean, I'm human, so of course some days it hurts, but I think for me the thing that I try to keep in mind is oftentimes People who spend a lot of time online being negative and saying hateful things, it's really a reflection of them. I don't think that you can be a happy person offline if you spend all your time online being negative and hateful. And that's really them projecting onto you. And I think for me, that was a self-reflective moment where I realized there were times in my life where I was being really negative online and it was because I wasn't happy in my career. It was because I wasn't happy where I was living or, you know, uh, just the things that were happening in my life were not lining up with what I wanted them, where I wanted them to be. And I was using the internet as a crutch. And I see a lot of people doing that. And I think that that makes it a little bit easier to dismiss those things and realize it's not about me, it's about them. So now you've created, and it's a chapter in your book, this idea of stop hating and get busy. And start studying. Yeah, Absolutely. So, so tell us a little bit about that. I mean, for me, I had to really be honest with myself and say that I had wasted a lot of my time being jealous and envious of people who were more successful than me. And uh, one of the things I talk about in my book was a moment that I met a young woman that I was very jealous of. And when I met her, she was so kind and she gave me such great career advice that I had this moment of, 
wow, I should have actually been studying what this girl was doing so that I could get to where she is instead of hating on her. And so stop hating, start studying <laughs> has been any time I'm like, ugh, that girl thinks she's everything. I have a moment of, oh wait, she really is everything. Let me go like read her blog or follow her on Twitter and, and listen to her podcast so I can get a little bit of insight into how this person has made the career moves that I want to make. So it's in the book as a chapter and you also so sell. I now have a journal. journal. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it, I, journaling has been so helpful for me and it has been a way for me to kind of plot out what my goals are and really mark those things off my list as they come, come around. Um, and so I teamed up with an amazing visual artist named Esso Tolson and he created this great logo for me that says stop hating, start studying. And we put it on a journal and, and people have been really excited and really into it. Okay. So Talk to me about a few people like Beyonce. You, t you talk about her in the book, right? Love, I mean, yeah. wh when do I not want to talk about Beyonce? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, she is, again, somebody who works extremely hard and is, you know, at the top of her game and has had this amazing longevity. And I think someone that we can all kind of learn from. And I use her and Destiny's Child as an analogy for allyship. I love analogies. They are the thing that are all through this book. Right. Um, and the idea that Destiny's Child is a group of three women, but we all know that Beyonce is the star of Destiny's Child. <laughs> and I think that allyship in some ways is like that as well, that yeah. we have to know that sometimes we need to be there to be Michelle or Kelly to uh, a, a group of people who need our support. And we're there, we've got cute outfits on, we're all doing choreography, yeah, yeah, so but one person, it's right. not a bad thing. Right. We are all there, our credit okay. scores are all great, but we are there to support that marginalized <laughs> group. We can't always be the center of attention. Talk to me about Kanye West and his, oh, yeah, I a lot of explaining to we do are all. That. I think we are all in a state of mourning because of Kanye. You know, I don't know what he's going through, but, uh, in retrospect, he has been saying things that are problematic for a while now. And I think that we were overlooking a lot of it because we love his music. And that's really difficult to separate the artist. What are you saying about him now? What am I, I'm trying to not say anything about him because his fans, his new uh, alt-right fan base on Twitter are very rabid. And I think oftentimes when you look at the people who are supporting you, that says a lot about what your message is. So he has an alt-right following. If you, if the these, things that he's tweeting, if yeah. you look at the responses, it's full of lots or of white supremacists. Absolutely, not alt-right. There I mean, are the, there are a lot of yeah. people who are latching onto his message and are using it as a way to try and silence black people. And I think that that's really dangerous when you realize that your words are being weaponized by people who say, oh, look, here's one black person I agree with. I'm not going to listen to any of these other black people because now Kanye West, whose music I've never listened to, whose messages I've never supported, now he says something that's in line with me because he thinks slavery was a choice. And now I'm going to use his words to try and silence you. And I think yeah. that that's, uh, to me, very telling. I would not be happy if those people were supporting me or my work. What about our Kelly, what are you saying about him? I am so glad that we are at a place where people are talking about the fact that his music, while maybe enjoyable, does not excuse the fact that he has behaved in many ways that are abusive, manipulative, and, and completely irresponsible. And he needs to be held accountable for those things. Um, it's frustrating that we are in this time where so many women are brave enough to come forward and talk about their experiences with sexual assault, and yet the voices of black women are often completely disregarded. And we've seen this throughout history, but especially in this instance, black women and girls have been the victims of R. Kelly's behavior, and they aren't getting the same level of attention. And you have personal experience with that. Talk with Unfortunately, us. Unfortunately, uh, you know, I used my platform to talk about consent and sexual assault because I have a personal experience and unfortunately too many women, too many people have had those experiences and I feel that when we come forward and use our voices to talk about them in a, in a responsible way that it can inspire other people to come forward and it can also inspire people to have conversations about what consent really means because unfortunately there are too many that do not understand.
who don't understand what the word means. They don't understand the concept, and I think that that's largely because of the society that we live in. You know, we watch movies and television shows where often women are coerced into sexual situations where they say, no, 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 okay, right? Or um, we live in a culture where often when a woman does come forward, she's blamed for what she's wearing or if she chose to go home with someone. So you did a video and you were you were supported for, for Oh, absolutely. I mean, I got a lot of negative comments talking about the idea that people are shamed when they come forward as, as uh, survivors of sexual assault. But I did get a lot of messages from people of all different walks of life who said that they had their eyes opened or they realized that they needed to come forward and talk about their experience. Uh, a young woman actually told me that she pressed charges against uh, a man that assaulted her, largely because she was inspired by a video that I made. So again, I do think it's difficult to come forward, but in my experience, oftentimes the hardest conversations to have are the most important ones. Right, right. So now you've got things going on. You have to do a podcast with your husband. I do. Who, by the way, by the way, is white. <laughs> he, he sure is. The whole time I've known him, he's been white. <laughs> right, Patrick. Right, yes. right. So, so we have a podcast together called Last Name Basis, uh, where we talk about pop culture, but we also talk about things that are interesting to us, whether that be animals or science or Florida, which is our home state, which is constantly embarrassing us. Yes. Uh, yes. So we have a really good time with it. Okay. And you've got a show in the works. Uh, yeah, I have a show in development at Comedy Central. And uh, in addition to my web series with MTV, so I, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm, I'm busy, but I feel very fortunate that all of these doors have opened for me because of the internet. Right, right, because of the internet. And you're gonna make it a better place. Right? I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying. I mean, I don't think I can take that on by myself, but I really am optimistic that we can make the internet and the world a better place if we're willing to have tough conversations, but also, be really transparent about the things that we've learned and the mistakes that we've made. So that's what my book's about. Yeah, so writing a book, how is that different uh, from your internet? More, char more characters. Yes. Um, you know, <laughs> Twitter is at 140. They've ex expanded to 240 for some people. I don't know why. I'm not one of those people yet. I still only have 140 <laughs> characters. Um, for me, a book was an opportunity to dive deeper into some stories and some conversations that I feel, again, the internet makes it difficult to have some of those conversations. You know, uh, Decoded is maybe five to six minutes each episode. Mm -hmm. And so it's not meant to be the be all end all in every conversation. It's really kind of like a primer, get you interested in a topic. But those episodes also aren't about me. They're not about my personal story. Sometimes I can infuse yeah, I want to some talk things a in there. Bit of, yeah, about your personal story. You okay. know, we always ask people to place themselves in Black America. Where, where do you place yourself? What were the influences that? that... Um, you know, I grew up um, in South Florida, a very middle class upbringing in the suburbs with two loving parents who uh, very early in my life decided that they did not love each other anymore, uh, right. which uh, was unfortunate. But I, in retrospect, realized that my parents' divorce was a really good thing for them. And I'm very fortunate that they have a great relationship. Um, I think that my parents really wanted me, like most, to have a better life than they had. So I went to private schools, and I think that while I got a great education, it really took me a little bit longer to really understand and accept my identity as a black person because I was in this space where I knew that I was black, but I was friends with people who either did not want to see my blackness or only saw my blackness and made me feel other because of it. Mm -hmm. And so um, when I got into adulthood is when I really got an opportunity to be exposed to different types of black people from all walks of life and understand that there's not just one specific way to be a black person. And I feel like that's a lot about what my, my work is about, is the fact that you can be whoever you are and it does not make you less than or the wrong kind of black or the right type of black person. Um, and I feel very fortunate that people have connected with that because unfortunately, especially after Stuff White Girls Say to Black Girls went viral, I realized there were a lot of people that were having very similar experiences where they were feeling maybe caught between two worlds mm -hmm. for a large part of their life, whether it was in the workplace or at school, where they 
wanted to just be themselves, but they felt like everybody was asking them to be yeah. something and else. Did you have uh, black women or men or who, who were your idols? Who were your... I mean, I mean, did I, you have role, role models that you could follow? or did Oh, you absolutely. I mean, I was a huge music fan, so I loved Brandy, and I loved the show Moesha. So when mm -hmm. she, you know, ventured into acting, that was something that I really looked up to her for because I thought it was so cool that she was able to tackle two different creative fields. Mm -hmm. Um, I also feel very fortunate that I had a mother who was, you know, very stately and gorgeous and, and confident and smart and hardworking to look up to. Um, I loved Janet Jackson, Mariah Carey. Um, I loved, you know, the girl groups En Vogue, right, Destiny's right, Child, right. Loved of Vogue. course. Right, right. Yeah, so I mean, I grew up watching and consuming probably too much TV. Um, <laughs> But yeah. for me, I think the reason that I connected with Moesha, for example, was I felt like she was somebody I could potentially be friends with. Mm -hmm. um, she was somebody who was smart and hardworking, but she didn't compromise her morals. You know, the show was really funny, but there was also a lesson in every episode, whether it be how she was related to her parents or being pressured to have sex or being at a party and not wanting to drink. Um, I'm, you know, kind of a prude myself. I'm not a big partier. And so I connected with being able right. to watch someone right. on television who... Yeah. Seemed like me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we always ask our guests as we're coming to a close, and you'll have to come back, please. Oh, please. So I hope much, so. Thank so you. So much fun. Uh, uh, the, to finish the statement, the power of the strength of black America lies in. What for, for you is that? The power and the strength of black America lies in our ability to create and tell fabulous stories, uh, no matter what hardships or adversities we go through. So, and you are definitely doing that. Oh, you are thank creating you so a much. pathway. What, what's the, when will you know that, well, you're successful already, but what's, <laughs> what's the goal? What's the big goal? Um, you know, for me, the goal has always been to create work that I'm proud of and hopefully make people laugh and make them think. And so I'm fortunate that that can take many forms. If that means a book, a television show, or working in film, that would be awesome. But I'm just as happy making a podcast with my husband from the studio <laughs> or um, saying funny things on Twitter. Right. I think there's so many different ways to reach people and, and make them laugh and think. Well, we thank you so much for making life fascinating and exciting for sure. And uh, we'll be following your career as you take over, take over Hollywood. Thank you um, so much. Yeah, and the book and of course the world. Uh, well, that escalated quickly. It certainly did. <laughs> Thank you so much. And so, we're so happy for you. Thank you. Francesca Ramsey for being with us Thank today. Thank you. And thanks for you all being with us today as well. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America. We'll see you the next time. And I'll see you in...